Welcome everyone to today's webinar, third in the series from Under My Scope, an initiative by the Department of Pathology, Ames, New Delhi, to bring experiences from our illustrious alumni. I would now invite Dr. Dinda, professor and ICMR Emeritus Scientist, who heads the Renal Pathology Group here, to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Dinda. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gitika. I think, uh, I think I am audible. So the, it, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Sri Gopal Sharma, uh, who is uh, one of our uh, alumni of the, uh, our Department of Pathology. So he's a uh, accomplished nephropathologist, and now he's the director of the uh, Arakana Laboratories. He joined there in 2014, and before that, he did his the uh, national boards. I mean, from the U.S. in the Columbia University, and uh, and then after that, he has uh, actually did a lot of the academic activities associated with the uh, nephropathology, and he has got also a varied interest uh, among the other things, uh, the new technology in the patent area. And he actually spent time uh, with uh, still uh, teaching and training the the, uh, the residents and other pathologists the uh, in various fora. So it will be it's a great occasion that to hear from him. And uh, so I uh, welcome him for his talk. And I'm sure it will be a very enjoyable one. And uh, you can you can have uh, the lot of issues uh, which it, it can be enlightened by his talk. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Srikopal, please. Thanks a lot for your kind introduction, sir. <clears throat> Dr. Dinda was my thesis guide uh, during my residency back at Ames. And I have spent many, many hours with him. So I did my uh, thesis in renal cell cancer. And he is one of the reasons I got interested in kidney pathology because I have signed out kidney with him at the end of the day a lot. So today we are going to talk about medical kidney biopsies, and you all can see my screen. So medical kidney biopsies are very specialized thing, right? Because we need to do light microscopy, we need to do immunofluorescence, we need to do electron microscopy. But in day-to-day -day life, most of us who are not like kidney pathologists in surgical pathology, we end up seeing kidney which is adjacent to the tumor. And in the CAP template, there is an area where you have to write what is the finding in that adjacent area. During residency, that part seemed least important, right? Because the most important thing is tumor. We end up spending a lot of time in finalizing the morphology of the tumor, grading that tumor, and we don't spend a lot of time in the medical kidney part. And for me, that is my entire life, right? That is my entire profession. I spend a lot of time for that particular sentence. What is the finding in that medical kidney? So in first 30 minutes, I wanted to go over some basics, how we can improve our <clears throat> findings, or our morphology, what we should write in that particular sentence and what we can learn. So when you interpret a medical kidney biopsy, <clears throat> it is always best to make your observation in compartments. So glomerular compartment, tubules, and interstitium, the area in between the tubules. Tubular interstitial compartment and blood vessels, vascular compartment. Why do I say that? Because when you look at a tumor, you're observing the entire morphology as a one picture in your mind. While when you're observing a medical kidney, you have to concentrate on individual compartment, one compartment at a time to appreciate the findings. And it is very important, specifically as a PG, to hone on your skills of what is normal. What do you call something as normal? Because if you know what is normal, you will be able to identify what is abnormal as you move forward in your career. So let's focus a few seconds on what is normal. So this is normal. This is a normal glomer line. This is a normal glomer list because the mesangium is not expanded. There is no increase in mesangial cellularity. Loops are open. There is nothing in the Bowman's space. The background tubules are back to back. The lumen is empty. There is nothing within the lumen. 
and the vessels are okay. They are not showing you any intimal fibrosis. That is normal. If you can just say that in the report, that is going to be very helpful. Because as we have made progress in the oncology world, your patients are going to undergo chronic kidney disease because of the problem in this adjacent kidney. Okay. So this is one more example of a normal kidney where you can see the normal glomerulus tubular interstitial compartment as well as the vascular compartment. So what are the common abnormalities which you can see in this kidney? So let's pick up some of the abnormalities. So as you can see, I am picking up PAS stains because for normal kidney, PAS stain is good. But in normal day-to-day -day practice, most of us are habituated of HNE stain because when you are analyzing that part of kidney, we are doing HNE stain. When you see on an HNE stain, everything appears to be homogenous. You cannot see the compartments very well. You cannot. You can see the glomerular, glomeruli as well as the tubular interstitial compartment, but the distinction or the differentiation is not very well. So let me show you how what a difference is between an HNE and a PAS. On a HNE stain, it is very difficult to appreciate the cellular part or the mesangial matrix part. It is very difficult to appreciate the basement membrane morphology. So what I would recommend when you are triaging your slides, pick up a slide on which you should do at least a PAS stain to analyze the area for medical kidney diseases. Because PA stain makes a lot of difference. Now you can see that. Can you see that? You can see the glomeruli very well. You can see the mesangium very well. You can see the tubules very well. So choose a slide on which you are going to perform a PAS and make your analysis and your observation on the PAS stain. Because on HNE, it is difficult to make those observations. You cannot observe or make your observations on the glance very well. So this is, these are two glands. You can see the expansion of the mesangium. You can see a little bit of increased cellularity. And over here, the gland is showing you a little bit of nodule formation. So if I am a postgraduate and I'm writing a report, I can definitely make an observation. This particular gland is showing me increased mesangial matrix. Cellularity is increased. Matrix is also increased, right? So to, for starters, main thing I'm going to think is diabetes, okay? If there's no history of diabetes, I'm going to think about hypertension and smoking. That is the basic. I should be able to pick that up. And in the background, other finding which you will see very often in the medical, uh, in the kidney is tubular injury. This is not necrosis because you're not seeing sloughing of the lining epithelium. What you're seeing is attenuation of the lining epithelium, loss of the brush border, and in places you can see prominent nucleoli. So this is acute tubular injury. One of the other things which I have seen frequently, like while during residency, I have seen that one of our favorite diagnoses, if we cannot find an abnormality, is what? Anyone? Any presence of inflammation is labeled as interstitial nephritis. That is not right. Because we end up calling many things as itis, right? Mild cholecystitis, mild gastritis. So just mere presence of inflammation in a medical kidney biopsy is not equal to tubular interstitial nephritis. And I have seen that term being used frequently in the biopsy, chronic tubular interstitial nephritis. In the medical kidney world, that term has a totally different meaning. So the image which I'm showing you right now over here, is that interstitial nephritis? How many of you are going to call this as an interstitial nephritis? You can write your chat comments in the YouTube part and we will go over. So are you going to call it or not? So if you ask me, this is not interstitial nephritis. On an HNE stain, it might be difficult to appreciate but the inflammatory cells are present only within the area of scar. That is, they are not present in the non-scar renal parenchyma. And let me show you the beauty of a PS stain. This is the same field, right? I'm showing you on a PS stain. 
This is the area of the scar. Inflammation is restricted only in the area of scarring, and you don't see that inflammation in rest of the parenchyma. And that is a big deal. This diagnosis appears small, but the meaning is totally different. You will attract inflammation in an area of scarring, and that is going to be nonspecific. If you say the word tubular interstitial nephritis, that to me as a nephrologist means something active is going on. I have to go back to the patient history to look for active drugs which are going on. And if it is an active interstitial nephritis process, I have to treat my patient. Because when the interstitial nephritis is going to heal, my patient is going to develop scarring. And all of us are born with fixed number of nephrons. So as a nephrologist, the prime job is to prevent that scarring. So you have to start treatment. So that is the importance of saying interstitial nephritis or not. So in this case, you're not going to call it. In this case, there is plain acute tubular injury. There is no nephritis because inflammation is restricted in the area of scarring. That's why you're not going to call it interstitial nephritis. You are going to call acute tubular injury you are going to call glomeruli with mesangial expansion. Look at the history. If your patient is diabetic, you can blame that on diabetes. If your patient is smoke, if not diabetic, most likely smoking, and look for the history of hypertension. So you're going to mention the glomerular disease. You are going to mention the tubular interstitial scarring part, and you're going to mention the vascular disease. So three pieces of information are very, very important for the nephrologist, you know? And it is going to make a huge difference in the patient's life. Because when you are following up your patient for carcinoma, the remaining kidney is going to determine the CKD prognosis. And nowadays, you will see most of the surgeries are being done are partial nephrectomy. They are not radical nephrectomy. When I did my pathology residency, most of the nephrectomies were radical nephrectomies. And because of this understanding and knowledge that the patients end up developing chronic kidney disease after surgery, we have switched towards partial nephrectomy. We are doing more and more partial nephrectomy. So I just wanted to show you a florid example of diabetes, okay? And these are the dead glands. So other problem which I have seen, in a wedge biopsy, you are having hundreds and hundreds of glands. It is very difficult to count. Like in this field, it is very easy for me to count. Okay, three glands, four glands are sclerotic, rest are open. I can easily come up with a percentage. But in a wedge biopsy, when you are dealing with so many hundreds of glands, it is difficult to make that count. But definitely try to come up with a percentage. So what I have seen, count close to 100 glands and see what is the approximate percentage of the dead glands and give that percentage. Because that as a clinician is a very helpful information because you are telling a clinician that the patient has lost close to 30 or 40% of the glomerular count and that is very helpful. So keep that count. So if you're not able to count like thousand glands, definitely count 100 or 200 and give an approximate percentage. So this is a very classical example of diabetes, right? So gradually as you grow up and you will become a renal pathologist and you will know there are a bunch of differentials for even a nodular diabetic glomerular sclerosis. But for starters, when you're a PG, this is okay to say, when I see a nodular glomerular sclerosis, you will go back, look into the chart and make a diagnosis of diabetes because that itself is going to be very, very helpful. And this is a bad vascular disease and you have got a lot of arteriolar hyalinosis also in this one. So this is diabetes. So let's move on to so, other uh, point. Shri, yeah, you have a question, Gitikan? Yeah, Shri, so um, can I just put a few questions out there and um, sure. before you kind of move on to the next one? Um, mm, yeah. So, so you are talking basically about the parenchyma, which is around a tumor in a partial nephrectomy, for yes. example. Right? So, I mean, mm -hmm. are there any recommendations about how many sections we should be taking? Uh, how much of the surrounding kidney we should be looking at? Are there any recommendations out there? Um, yeah, I'm not aware of any recommendations, Gitika, but you have to be away from the tumor because the changes which you will see adjacent to, uh, to the tumor are not represented. They are just reacting to the tumor part. So stay away from the tumor and take multiple sections. Grossly, you can see the uh, kidney. Stay away from the scar. Okay. That Those are the two. So uh, stay away from the subcapsular scarring and the area adjacent to the tumor. So normally I have seen people take at least one or two sections. Right. So 
That I think should be enough and representative if the gross examination is good. And routine surgical path sections are five microns. So whatever I'm saying, the medical kidney biopsy is interpreted at three microns. So either you can tell your lab upfront, hey, when I label this section this way, take that as a three micron thickness, because that is very important to interpret a medical kidney biopsy. Because when I say misangial cellularity, matrix increase, all the criteria are set for three microns, not for five microns. So true. I think that's a really important point because uh, when we're looking at kidney, we're so attuned to looking at small cores that when you get larger kidney, uh, so that was really the next kind of follow-up question that all, all our classifications are based on renal biopsies. And, you know, like how do you um, kind of extrapolate? So you said count 100 glomeruli and kind of get percentages from there. And maybe that's how we extrapolate for our classifications. Yes, so basically, <clears throat> suppose if I end up having four sections uh, of the benign kidney, what I'm going to do, I will look at all those four sections and I will try to find a representative slide and I'm going to do everything on that representative slide. Why do I say that? Because say if the extent of scarring is more in one cortex, not in the other one, because then that is just a cortical scar that is not representation of the entire kidney. That's why you have to do everything on that representative kidney. So that's why if you're taking three or four sections, see what is the morphology of the overall kidney and what is the gross examination of the kidney because everything depends on the representative slide. Yes, you can extrapolate everything which we have discussed on the representative slide. Uh, I completely agree. I think that's a great uh, concept. Uh, uh, we have one question in the chat box, if I can just ask you right now. So when counting yeah. sclerotic glomeruli, should we include those glomeruli with significant periglomerular fibrosis? It depends, right? Uh, ideally, uh, if the periglomerular, the glom, which is showing you periglomerular fibrosis, if the tufts are intact, you are going to count them as intact glands. If they are dead, you are going to count them as sclerotic gland. One important thing is to identify segmental sclerosis. So I will tell you what is the most common form you are going to encounter and how are you going to make a diagnosis? Because what happens, you are not going to encounter most likely GN kind of scenarios. The most common finding you will find is diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. Okay. So those are the most common findings you are going to find. Yeah. So that was my follow-up question. What's the most common lesion you've seen um, in a peritumoral kidney? Yeah. Those are the most common uh, questions, uh, things I will say. One of the findings, like tubular interstitial nephritis, which you see in many templates, but that is not the real thing. I will tell you like, yes, you can see it, but most of the time it is not real. It uh, is artifactual. Think, uh, yeah, last question before we we're in, you know, really want to get on to the next is uh, what do you do about IF? Do you ever need to do IF or is GNs are relatively rare and? Yeah, <clears throat> so that that is where I think Help with a pathologist is very important, kidney pathologist. Because as a general surgical pathologist, it is very difficult to interpret for IF. So what I will say, identify your trigger points or limitations. So what I said, you can identify normal, you can identify diabetes, hypertension, and I will show you a couple of examples of FSGS and decision. Anything which is not following those criteria, go ahead and show the slide to the kidney pathologist. Because the call for IF is going to be very broad because kidney pathology is not pure morphology. It is clinical history. So whether to do IF or not will be dependent on the clinical history. I have to look at the clinical history of the patient. What is the creatinine? What is the extent of proteinuria? Hematuria is important, but when you are doing the surgery for the tumor, your patient is anyways going to have hematuria. So you have to wait for a while to see whether that hematuria is a glomerular one or a non-glomerular one. So, it is possible that you might not request an IF at the time of signing that up, but if you have written your findings, subsequently your patient ends up developing that, a kidney pathologist can read your report and can do an IF on that because you can still do IF on the paraffin tissue. So I will say the decision for doing an IF, if you see a deviation, if you end up seeing a lot of cellularity, you know, if your patient's creatinine is up, if the urine sediment was active, before the diagnosis of cancer, you know, if the uh, nephrologist is suspecting a medical kidney disease, definitely show the slide to a 
renal pathologists because there are some subtle findings. Like for IF, like active, I will be seeing RBC cast, specifically degenerating red cell cast. But again, those are subtle findings. So definitely talk to your kidney pathologist. Okay. So as I'm showing you <clears throat> some examples of FSGS, and I mentioned obesity is one common. Can you, as an audience, can you please write, how do you define obesity? What is obesity? Can you please write that on the chat box and Gitika can tell me the BMI, which is being used to make a diagnosis of obesity, okay? So, so this is, this was the finding I was trying to mention. You will see FSGS. As a kidney pathologist, there are morphological variations of FSGS, but you might not have to worry about it at the time of sign on because for classification, you can always ask your colleague, hey, how will you classify? What is the clinical implications? Because FSGS is a big entity in itself, okay? But you can make a diagnosis immediately of FSGS by seeing sclerotic type. By that, I mean, you cannot see the open lumen matrix in that area is increased and the tuft is adhered to the Bowman's capsule, okay? In simple layman terms, if I cannot see this morphology, which is normal, and if I see this morphology, this is segmental sclerosis. That's it. If I can just say FSGS or segmental sclerosis, that is enough. I should be able to pick that up in the adjacent kidney. And you might end up seeing that. We, Gitika mentioned initially, like how many sections or how many slides are going to be enough to evaluate? So from the history, if I look at the history, if my patient is obese, if the patient was having bad hypertension, you might end up doing two or three sections because see, FSGS is a focal disease. You might not end up seeing the disease only in one section, okay, or only in one level. So normally what I have seen in surgical pathology, we take only one section and we do only one level. That might not be enough for FSGS because you might end up missing FSGS. This is the same biopsy, same slide, different levels. You were not able to see this gland on the earlier levels, but you can see that in the later levels. In this one, you can see this is glomerulomegaly. Why do I say this is glomerulomegaly? Because I am at 40X and I cannot see the tuft like it is occupying more than 50% of the my field. And you can see in the image, it is occupying your entire field. This is glomerulomegaly. Size of the gland is increased. This diagnosis itself can help the clinician explain the proteinuria. So just by making one observation, you are making a significant difference in the patient's life because you have helped the clinician explain the proteinuria which the patient is having. Ditika, did you get an answer? What is the BMI to define obesity? Uh, Shri, mostly it's BMI more than 30. And uh, we have a few of more than 28, one more than 31. Okay. So this I think right? a lot of data, this data came out from AIMS actually. A lot of studies have come out. <clears throat> Asian Indians, the BMI, criteria for obesity is more than 25. If you look at the literature, a lot of literature has come out. Incidence of diabetes is a lot in Asian Indians. Like we are very prone for diabetes. We are very prone for diseases related to obesity. So definition has been changed for Indians. So overweight is 24 to 25 and above 25, it is obese. So yes, that criteria which you are mentioning above 35, uh, about 30, it is good for Caucasians and other ethnicities, but for Indians, it is above 25. So as soon as you change that definition, obesity-related glomerulopathy and the problems are going to increase because that we have seen, if you look at the Indian literature, a ton of studies on the risk factors from the endocrinology world has come up, like how the BMI is making a difference. And we know in kidney world, obesity does affect the kidney, like specifically proteinuria. Two things I mentioned, Glomerulomegaly and perihilar FSGS, they are both adaptive form, and you can see that in adjacent kidney. And if you mention that, that is a reversible thing. Because if you mention that in your report, your patients after the surgery, they, they are very receptive for feedback. If you can give a feedback, hey, go ahead and reduce your weight, you are going to improve that life significantly. 
when we talk about rare diseases in kidneys as well as in other branches, we think only making a rare diagnosis makes a significant patient impact. But to me, making a simple diagnosis can sometimes make a significant impact. So what I just said can make a significant impact in the quality of life of the patient. Just diagnosing obesity-related glomerulopathy, you are going to reduce the filter, uh, proteinuria part. Your patient is not going to progress very fast on CKD. So, and this is the perihilar FSGS. You might end up seeing that also. And this is called perihilar because it is next to the blood vessel. But I don't want you to bother about subclassifying FSGS. You can always talk to your kidney pathologist colleague, hey, can you classify that? Because you have to correlate that with clinical history. You have to correlate that, that with albumin, urine protein. It becomes complex. But when you are triaging, just identify FSGS and talk to your nephrologist and kidney pathologist at that time, okay? Last concept, <clears throat> I touched that concept briefly. I wanted to explain you. One finding which I have seen frequently is mention of tubular interstitial nephritis. So what we end up doing, as soon as we see inflammation in the kidney, we end up writing that sentence, tubular interstitial nephritis. That is not right. As I said earlier, this part, this year, the inflammation is present in the area of scarring. That is okay. I don't have to say tubular interstitial nephritis. I can just say inflammation is present within the area of scarring. That's it. When do I make a diagnosis of tubular interstitial nephritis? What is the criteria? The criteria is <clears throat> I have to go away from the area of scarring, okay? I have to move away from the area of scarring. So in this case, in the low part, you can see this was the area of scar. If I see inflammation in this area, I cannot make a diagnosis of tubular interstitial nephritis. But when I saw the inflammation, which is extending outside that area of scarring, and if that inflammation ends up damaging the tubules, causing tubulitis. By tubulitis, I mean lymphocytes entering inside the tubule, causing tubulitis. Now I can call this as chronic active tubular interstitial nephritis. Chronic I'm calling because of the chronic part. Active I'm saying because this damage is ongoing. So I'm basically asking and requesting my clinician, hey, go ahead and correlate with the clinical history stop the agent which is driving that interstitial nephritis and if needed clinically start steroids that is the complete meaning of the word interstitial nephritis so we cannot use that lightly okay any questions so far you have <clears throat> yeah see no, there are two questions in the chat box mm -hmm. the number one is from dr ritamra disuza she's asking uh, how do you proceed when you encounter immature glomeruli in the kidney in a background of a pediatric renal uh, tumors like Wilms tumor? Does that mean a syndromic disease? It depends on the context, right? Yeah, it depends on the context of what was the presentation. I have to just write that in the, uh, what I would say, in the template part and have to correlate with the history. Okay. The other question is, uh, how to distinguish between de novo medical disease from the changes which have occurred due to some vascular or hemodynamic event adjacent to the tumor? Most of those changes are acute tubular injury. So they are not going to be glomerular injury. At the most, you will see some congestion by, of the blood vessels, glomeruli, and all that. You are not going to see any active interstitial inflammation. Itis part should not happen because of the surgery. If you're away from the tumor part, adjacent to the tumor part is non-specific inflammation and scarring. So that's why you have to interpret away from that scar. Okay. So one last thing, like Vitika was asking, like when to do IF and R. I wanted to show you a little deviation from the normal. So this is not normal. You are seeing inflammation within the glomeruli. These are the cells which should not be present there. If I see that, I'm going to ask my kidney pathologist to do staining and something, you know? So this is a trivial example. So I have shown you ton of normal. So any deviation from normal, I have to ask for the clinical history, IF, EM to classify that. So this is one of the example of abnormal where I have to dissect it further, okay? And that was all of us kidney adjacent to the tumor plant. And I know <clears throat> we have a lot of surgical pathologists in our audience. 
So kidney pathology is important, but it goes hand in hand. Knowledge of surgical pathology is also very important, right? So I wanted to <clears throat> now start some medical kidney biopsies, okay? And I would like your help in understanding the morphology. So what I'm showing you is a transplant biopsy. The patient is a 66 year old male. The transplant was performed two years back and now the patient presents for evaluation of acute kidney injury with elevated creatinine of 3.6. That is the entire history you got. So I'm going to show you some fields and I want you to write your observations and differentials in that area. And our moderators will tell me, what are you all thinking, okay? Because you all are very good in surgical pathology as well as medical kidney pathology. So I want you to make your observations and tell me what are you thinking. I'm going to show you the field, okay? I'm not going to describe this field for you, but this is exactly, I have chosen the best possible slide, which is reflecting very well, okay? So if you can tell me your findings, if I can stop here, this is a very representative image. You can see the glomerulus, you can see the tubular interstitial depart, um, compartment, and you can see a few more things. And if you can give me your feedback, what you are seeing in the exam, suppose if I give you this as a spotter, give me your differentials now. So that would be awesome. Are you getting any answers, Adesh? Yeah, actually, one, uh, one of the participants is saying that is tubular interstitial edema. Got it. Got it. Perfect. Very brave. And I'm really glad. So observations wise. So <clears throat> whenever we approach any disease, we end up, our brain ends up making an attempt to make a diagnosis. Give me the answer right now. That is not right. Whenever you are approaching a medical kidney biopsy, make observations and diagnosis will follow that observation, okay? So in this case, I'm making my observations allowed. This is the glomerulus. This is the tubular interstitial compartment, and I'm seeing some spaces, okay? I'm seeing some spaces. I don't know what they are, and I'm seeing some tubules. So what is happening, these spaces are present in between the tubules, and there is interstitium, which I know is an interstitium. Interstitium is present in between those spaces as well as the tubules. So in a normal kidney, what is the thing which is present? Peritubular capillaries are present normally here, right? So is it ectatic peritubular capillaries which are present over here? Or <clears throat> I have never seen such ectatic peritubular capillaries because I can see some of the peritubular capillaries which are here, but these are very dilated, right? So am I dealing with some kind of vascular malformation over here? Because this is not normal, right? And most likely this is not solely interstitial edema because in the low power that comes as a differential. But when you start focusing on this spaces, you can see some kind of lining epithelium right here. You can see some kind of lining epithelium over here. So they are just not edematous spaces. So basically, if you have to make a conclusion on this one, so basically I'm seeing ectatic channels. And I'm thinking it might be some kind of vascular abnormality, okay? That is all I can say. So again, you can convey that to the clinician and you can take things forward from that point. You can ask more clinical history. Fortunately, before giving an answer to that one, I wanted to show you one more image, okay? And I want to see if that image helps you make a diagnosis or not. This is again, an allograft biopsy from the same patient performed six months after the first one. So what you are looking at the same patient's biopsy six months after the first one, and this is the feel, right? So are you now closer to the diagnosis? Because this one is much more classical of a particular disease than the last one. Last one was a very difficult one. You cannot make a diagnosis, but on this one, I'm definitely going to call upon our surgical pathology friends because they have seen this much more frequently than kidney pathologists. This is a very rare entity for kidney pathologists. But in surgical path, specifically now I'm going to give you a hint. In dermal path, 
you might have seen that. So now, do you have an answer? If you have an answer, tell me a stain which is going to clinch the diagnosis. So Others, do you have an answer? Geetika, any answers? Yeah. Yeah, lots, lots, Shri. We have uh, Dr. Swarnalata, dilated lymphatics. Dr. Prashant Sen Gupta, lymphangiectasia. Uh, Dr. Bala, smooth muscle. I'm not sure exactly what that is. Uh, Dr. Ritambra, likely lymphatics. Um, uh, Dr. Hemanti, tubular interstitial edema with lymphocytic infiltrate. So we have a lot of lymphangiectasia there. I agree. So surgical path friends must have seen that. So I asked you one stain, which is going to help me clinch the diagnosis. So a few things in the history, which is going to help us. This is a transplant, okay? Transplant biopsy. Initially, we were all in the vascular area, right? We were thinking something is vascular related. I end up showing you a biopsy six months after the first one, and you can see a lot of spindle cell areas, like right? that's why that smooth muscle differential came. And you can imagine some kind of spaces, right? So I wanted you to have one stain, which is going to clinch the diagnosis. So if in that question itself, the answer is embedded. Because if you're thinking about lymphatics or vascular, I will say D240, CD34, CD, but that is not going to help you to clinch the diagnosis. I said one stain. So let me show you that stain and see. This is HHV8. Oh. So this is Kaposi sarcoma. <laughs> Okay. It's very rare in, yeah. Yeah. in the kidney, but that is how it evolves. Initially, it will just some ectatic vascular channels, and gradually you will see proliferation. And this is one of the common tumors which you will see post solid organ transplant. But it is so, but you see that in skin. That's why dumb path will see that more frequently. Visceral involvement is not that common. Visceral involvement is more common with heart transplant, lung transplant. In kidney, as such, Kaposi sarcoma is not very common. And a lot of our participants have clinched it. I think as you gave a few more hints, uh, Dr. Uh -huh. Gyan Priya, uh, Dr. Shahir uh, got AV malformation. So we got Kaposi sarcoma there, Dr. Swarn Lata, and HHV8 has also come out in the chat box. But that yeah, was an amazing once in a lifetime. Um, I think that's really nice. Thank you. So that is where I think, so kidney pathology, surgical pathology, we need to talk to each other more because you will end up seeing diseases in medical kidneys. All surgical, it is much easier for a surgical pathologist to make a diagnosis, but we don't see that often. So it's difficult for us to make that diagnosis, okay? So, so I will show you one more case, okay? Like I remember this case during my residency days and I felt so happy when I made the diagnosis, right? So, and the name also is pretty cool. So I'm not going to steal all the thunder and I will give you one fear and I think you can make a diagnosis. At AIMS every Friday, we used to have unknowns, right? So there were some unknowns where you have to make an approach and it is very difficult while some unknowns were considered as spotters. So this is one of those spotters. If I give you this history that this is from some area, which I'm not going to tell you, you will clinch the diagnosis. You will make the diagnosis just like that. But this is a kidney biopsy. And you are seeing, and this is a very representative field of that biopsy. I will let you have your own time in making the diagnosis because this is a very representative field of uh, that particular disease entity. <clears throat> I will let you make your observations without guiding you, okay? And I have chosen an HNE stain, and I will show you the beauty of other stains once you have made your diagnosis on HNE stain. So, as you are making your observations, I will also make my observations simultaneously. You, I'm saying this is kidney, that's why I believe this is kidney, but I don't see any evidence of gloms or tubular interstitial compartment. The entire normal parenchyma of the kidney is replaced, okay? Why? fibrous areas, this pink areas are fibrous areas. And I see a lot of inflammation, ton of plasma cells, lymphoid cells, some histiocytes. See, you are saying this is classical, but I don't think this is just non-specific tubular interstitial scarring with prominent plasma cells, right? Anyone with a diagnosis yet, or are you looking for something which I should show you? So I know lymphocytes and plasma cells are not going to help you to make a diagnosis, a specific one. And I'm, 
dealing with rare diseases. So I'm taking a bear and hopefully that will help. But as I said, for me, other stains are much more beautiful. I enjoy my findings over there. So let me show you an unexpected stain, like, and which will help you to clinch the diagnosis. And now I think all of you are going to get the diagnosis. So, so did you, can anyone clinch the diagnosis or this stain helps them to clinch the diagnosis? Um, Shri, we have amyloidosis, lots of amyloidosis, um, IgG4 disease, um, malacoplakia, plasma cytoma. Okay. Yeah, a few IgG4. We have a metastasis. Got it. So right now the field I'm showing, I'm saying this is classical. You can see that in multiple diseases. You have to know more history. But I'm, what I'm showing you in this field is our histiocytes. And they're showing you the term I loved when I learned it first time in my empiripolysis, right? So these are histiocytes which are showing you empiripolysis. This patient was found to have systemic Rosai Dorfman disease, okay? So this is Rosai Dorfman disease involving the kidney. And sometimes it does, it's very rare for it to involve the kidney, but sometimes it can present as a solitary mass. But in this patient, it was widespread. The patient had a widespread uh, Rosai Dorfman and it ended up just involving the kidney. So it was easier for the kidney perspective to make, make a diagnosis. But as such, it is very rare for Rosai Dorfman to involve the kidney. But yes, there are case reports which have shown. And the way you will characterize those um, histocytes is by doing a S100 and a CD68 stain. They are negative for CD1A. So the stain which I showed you was CD68. And <clears throat> this is S100. So histocytes are positive for S100 and CD68. So this is another example of a very rare disease within the medical kidney, Rosai Dorfman disease. But this is again an overlap of general surgical pathology with medical kidney, where a surgical pathologist helps us to make a diagnosis. <clears throat> so I saw a couple of differentials, Gitika, on that one, <clears throat> like plasma cell, my, like plasma cytoma, amyloidosis. We will see, I will discuss those differentials. It is not, uh, uh, you are seeing a lot of plasma cells. Differential will be definitely a plasma cytoma, but the pattern was very reactive in that one. So that is a hint which will take you away from the malignancy, histocytes were there, but definitely if you are sus suspecting uh, plasma cytoma, you have to do H for kappa and lambda, okay? So now I will switch to pure kidney. Okay, I will go away from those transition cases and I will switch to pure kidney, but still there will be some fun for general surgical pathologist too. Okay, so this is a medical kidney biopsy from a patient who is a 67 year old female who presents for evaluation of acute kidney injury, proteinuria and ascites. Okay, the patient history is significant for diabetes mellitus and hypertension. SPEP is pending and creatinine is 3.2 and albumin is 2.6, okay? We were discussing like things which you can see in the kidney adjacent to a tumor. Sometimes you can see this too. Anyone who can clinch the diagnosis. I'm going to move ahead. You can write the diagnosis in the chat box but I'm just going to make some observations along with you as we are going to review this. This is an HNE stain, okay? So I showed you a ton of diabetes. So most likely I'm showing you another example of diabetes. I told you the patient is diabetic. So boom, I made the diagnosis and I can move on to the next case, right? <clears throat> but in medical kidney diseases, you have to wait and make multiple observations. And I said, you have to observe multiple compartments. So in this one, the glomerular compartment is involved because I can see the expansion of the mesangium and I can see the tubules, they are not back to back. There is something pink in the interstitium which is expanding the tubules, okay? But I'm showing you HNE stain, that's it. You cannot make a lot of observations on HNE stain, that's it. You have to use your other stains to make the observation. Like, what is this thing which is expanding the inter interstitium? What is this thing which is expanding the gland, okay? So to 
explore that further, you need help of other staying. So I love PAS, so I will move on to the PAS section. And immediately, it brings out many things. This pink is normal, right? We saw multiple examples of diabetes where the mesangium was expanded. So you can see the expanded mesangium. This is a little pale as compared to that. When you see the tubular interstitial compartment, you see the expansion by this pale material. I'm calling it spare because as compared to the other PAS stained stuff in the background, this is spare. This is not st staying, staining strongly with the PAS stain. That's why I'm calling that as a pale. So any answers for this one, Gitika, yet? Did anyone clinch the diagnosis? This is, I will call as a spotter. This is a spotter. Uh, yes, Sri, we have uh, a myelodosis. And I think that's for the pale material and the vascular disease is athero emboli. Perfect. Yeah. And that is perfect. And you can see that frequently, you know. So specifically, if the patient has undergone any uh, vascular procedure previously in life, you can definitely see that. Yes. So you made the diagnosis in this one. This pink pale material is basically you are suspecting amyloid. Is that enough? I wanted to show you before I move on and confirm or refute the diagnosis by performing an IF, let's make the observation again on a silver stain. Can you see the silver stain? The stains are beautiful in kidney and they are very helpful for us to clinch a diagnosis. See this silver stain, this nodules, they are silver rich. You can see some pale areas. See this area is silver pale, this area is silver pale, this area is pale. And you can see similar pale areas in the interstitial. That tells you something from outside has come. And in this one, you are thinking amyloid because this pale material is present both within the glands as well as within the interstitial. That's why you are thinking about amyloid on this one, okay? So what is the other thing which you need to make a diagnosis on this one, okay? Congruent, obviously, right? So we did a congruent and it is positive. It, so congruent always has a problem in displaying very well. So on the screen, you might not see, but I can see congruent positive material both within the gland as well as interstitial. So yes, we are dealing with amyloid, but we need to characterize the amyloid further, okay? So we need immunofluorescence stain. So this is the IF stain. The amyloid is positive for lambda. It is negative for kappa, so that was helpful. Amyloid, another image which shows you positive for lambda and negative for kappa. And on electron microscopy, you can see fibrils, which are very characteristic for amyloidosis. Okay. So this is the diagnosis. Are you all happy with it? Do you think we did a good job? We worked up this case. Can I move on to the next case? This was all good. Are you all happy? Do you think we missed anything? We completed this entire case, right? Uh, looks like a, a good diagnosis. Everyone is happy? Yeah. Perfect. So, you know, there is always going to be a trick. <laughs> so what are the things which are bothering you? There are always, as a kidney pathologist, you always need an explanation of things, right? So what is bothering me? is on the IF, I showed you blood vessels. When I look at the light microscopy, I'm time again telling you there's a lot of amyloid, interstitium is positive, glomps are positive, blood vessels are positive. But when I ended up showing you the IF, I, and IF was right here. I'm showing you only the blood vessels. I'm not showing you the interstitiums. The interstitium, is not staining. What's happening? So you have, see, that's why what is not staining in the IF is also important. You have to continuously ask yourself that question. So, okay, this material, if it is a amyloid, is positive for lambda, the background material, which was similarly very chunky, should have stained for amyloid, right? Why it is not staining? So you ask yourself that question, you move on to the light microscopy, and you see there is a ton of congruent positive material within the background, and that is not picking up on IF. What's going on? The stain didn't work? What's going on? 
do you, so the next question you have to ask yourself, what is the pattern of amyloid or which form of amyloid involves the tubular interstitial compartment more? That's the question you need to ask. Or did something go wrong with our staining that only the vessels are staining, not the interstitial compartment? Can you throw some light on it? Can you help me out? So you can write your answers, and the answer is right here. Deepika, any answers which popped up? Uh, yes, Dr. Gyanapriya says LEC2. Perfect, that is the absolute answer. So this patient has a combination of AL amyloidosis and LEC2 amyloidosis. LEC2 is, can be a common incidental finding in kidney biopsies. And why do I bring that up? Because in US, mostly it is reported in Hispanics, but there are only case reports from India. In India, it is, has been reported in Punjabis, right? And I have seen case reports from Pakistan also. So what happens when we think about amyloid, we think about nephrotic syndrome, we think about proteinuria, but leg two amyloidosis might not present like that. It might present as a predominant tubular interstitial disease process. So you might not end up getting that much of proteinuria, but it is important to suspect like two because it can be an incidental finding. And in this one, this was a florid example of lectome, but you might end up dealing with cases which are not that florid. So you have to suspect, do a Congo there, and it can coexist with other diseases. So that those are the, some of the take home messages I want to convey. So most likely lectome is existent in India. We might be able to see more cases of lectome, okay? So this is one of the examples where the, your patient has multiple diagnoses. Your patient has got diabetes, your patient, has got leg two, your patient has got AL amyloid, your patient has got cholesterol emboli, the patient has got multiple, multiple diagnoses. So as a pathologist, you not only report the findings, you also end up describing like what is the importance of individual finding, right? So when I'm dealing with leg two amyloidosis, it's very important to convey to the clinician, hey, you are not dealing with a lymphoma or a myeloma right now. But AL amyloidosis will be associated with that. So treatment and prognosis is going to be completely different. So, and you have to convey the extent of scarring of the kidney because the treatment and prognosis will be dependent on that. So you write a comment and you say, what do you think is the predominant finding? What is driving the disease? So you always specify that in the comment section, okay? If there are no more questions, we will move on to our next case. Any questions, Gitika, on that one? Can we move on to our next case? No, I think we can move on, Shri. Okay, perfect. So the next case is from a patient who is 55 years old, and he presents for evaluation of acute kidney injury. Urine analysis shows both proteinuria as well as hematuria. Serology is pending at the time of performing the biopsy, okay? So this is a good field on HNA to make observation. I'm seeing glomeruli. The normal morphology of the glomeruli is totally distorted. I'm seeing proliferation in the extra glomerular region. The glomerulus itself is showing me proliferation, okay? I don't have to classify what kind of proliferation, but as a surgical pathologist, we were discussing about normal and abnormal. But if I want to make observations, I can see, okay, mesangium is expanded, then maybe some mesangial cells, leukocytes are also infiltrating. I cannot see the capillary loops. A very easy way to know whether you have endocapillary proliferation or not is to look at the loops. If the loops are open or intact, most likely you're not having endocapillary proliferation. If the loops are gone, you cannot see the intact loops. You're dealing with endocapillary proliferation. So basically proliferation, proliferation, proliferation all over the place. You're seeing proliferation within the gland. You're seeing the proliferation outside the gland. And this is an HNE stain. And in the background, you are seeing a lot of tubular injury and you are seeing cellular debris, you are seeing red blood cell cast also. So now the question you are asking yourself, what is that proliferation? 
you want to know more about that proliferation. So you do a PS stain and you can see now more clearly, right? So yes, our hypothesis was absolutely right. The proliferation is mesangial based and endocapillary based, and you are seeing some disruption. What do I mean by that? This is an intact glomerular tuff. Over here, you cannot see that. Almost something from outside ran over that particular gland. So it is like a crescent which damaged that particular gland. This is known as crescent. So you are dealing with crescents also. And again, more example of crescents, tubular injury. And gradually, as the crescents will heal, you will end up seeing some segmental sclerosis also. One of the good stains to appreciate the morphology of the crescents is silver stain. Okay, silver stain is considered as very good to appreciate crescents. So this is the silver stain, and you can see whatever I said earlier. This is a beautiful glomerulus showing you proliferation within the glomerular tuft. You can see the GBM rupture. You can see the fibrin. So this is fibrinoid necrosis. And you can see the GPM rupture with a crescent. Any thoughts you have so far on the differential diagnosis? I would love to know your thoughts on the differential diagnosis. So far on what I have shown you. If you can give me your differential, that will be great. And I will just stop for a while to listen to your differential and your thought process on this case, okay? So help me out. Any feedback, Deepika? Adarsh? Yeah, I think we just give it. A few more seconds, okay. Yeah. So basically I'm interested to know your thoughts on the differential, what are you thinking? What's going on with this kidney? Because I have shown you the morphology and I have stopped at a place which is quite representative of what I have shown. So tell me your thought process. If you have questions, ask me questions. Hey Shri, I would like to know more before I make a diagnosis. So I'm going to show you the rest, right? IF, I'm going to show you, but what is your differential on light microscopy? And what are the questions you are going to ask yourself on light microscopy is important. Uh, Shri, just for the audience, can you just quickly recapitulate the clinical? How old was this patient? Yeah, the patient was in 50s. The patient presented for evaluation of acute kidney injury. Urine analysis shows proteinuria and hematuria. Serology is pending at the time of biopsy. Okay. And uh, Dr. Vikram Deshpande has joined us and says that he has more hair than you, but he's loving your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, sir. I enjoyed your presentation, too. I wanted to know IgG4 today, but I was not aware you are coming. I have a ton of questions on IgG4. So maybe next time we can do IgG4. Okay. We have some uh, differentials on the chat box. Um, okay. Them. We have a crescentic IgA. We have okay. an Anka GN. Mm -hmm. We have SLE. Uh, mm -hmm. There are two or three SLEs there, so lupus. Then we have a post streptococcal GN. Mm -hmm. um, I love the differential. GN, yeah, everything basically, I think. So I love the differential so far, Gitika. So let's approach this case just on the basis of morphology. And let me explain you. So IgA, yes, definitely. IgA can be a differential and both primary and secondary, most likely you are dealing with a secondary, like an infection, right? Because you are seeing proliferation, you are seeing necrosis or a crescent. Yes, definitely infection will come in the differential. But anchor, not that much. Not traditionally. Because anchor, traditionally, the glomerular tuft or the glomeruli, which are not involved by anchor, should not show you proliferation. So in pure anchor, like anchor, which is not associated with infection, you should not see that much of proliferation. So remember in lupus, sometimes we think anchor is playing a predominant role. In those cases, you don't see that much of proliferation. Lupus definitely is a good differential. Always lupus is going to come in a differential. But <clears throat> typically in a, the, like the Friday conference, if there is something important, you put that right in front and people are not able to guess because I have punished you completely in the fields which I've shown you earlier, I'm showing you something and no one is picking this up, right? So I'm showing you something which I have not shown you. I have not even mentioned uh, in the description till now, but it is right there in front of you. What is that? So you can tell me, I have no clue what is that, but identify that there is something in the field which we have 
Ignore it completely. We have not discussed it so far. Okay, so let me describe this stuff which is there. This is something which is pale in my office, not showing me any staining with the silver stain. I know this is not fib uh, fibrin. This is not staining like fibrin. So this is not fibrinoid necrosis, but I don't know what is that. Okay, show me some other stains. Now I am very curious. Okay, so this is the PAS stain. I did go through those fields earlier. So this is the PS stain. You can see the same stuff, which I mentioned on the silver stain right here. And you can see the global morphology, which we discussed earlier, and we focused so much, but we ended up missing this thing, which was there right in front of us. So what do you think is this stuff? What do you need from me to make a diagnosis on that? What do you think is that material? Do you need anything else from me to make that diagnosis? I'll show you a trichrome stain. In the meanwhile, as you are thinking very hard, I think this trichrome is beautiful, right? You will clinch the diagnosis right now. And the diagnosis is coming. Githigad, multiple diagnoses popped up in the chat box, and everyone got it. Am I right? I think we give it a few seconds. Just give us a few seconds. We have a few. Definitely. You can ask me more stands. You are welcome to ask me more stands because I'm not expecting a, like straight because I'm dealing with rare diseases, right? But the rare diseases are also they start somewhere. So, so if, if we, so we we recapitulate this material is weekly past positive. Silver was well, negative. It was not standing with silver. It was PS pale, and, and it, it is, is blue gray blue with the trichrome stain. Yeah, I think we have a few. Uh, so I spilled all the buzzwords for something, Gitika. So collagenofibrotic, collagenofibrotic, uh, highline deposit, cryoglobulinemia. These are, um, there's also, uh, Dr. Swanatha, collapsing. Okay. Uh, so let's deal with one differential at a time. Can we, know, Congo red? Yeah. Can we just know about the Congo red before? That was the exact question I was waiting for. Yes, someone please ask Congo red. <laughs> yes. We have a yes. lovely uh, audience today. They've asked Congo red. And we have one more fibrillary and lipoprotein. Oh, so you got it, right? So do you think we got the diagnosis? Yes. Well, what do you need? You need IF, right? So you need IF to make the diagnosis. So let me show you the immunofluorescence findings. So what are you expecting on immunofluorescence, though? What is more common? What are you expecting on immunofluorescence? You can write that on the chat box, and I'll move forward on the immunofluorescence. So this was the immunofluorescence, and it shows apple green birefringence. And this is IF. This is IgG. <clears throat> This is C3, this is kappa, this is lambda. Were you all able to digest the finding? I think I moved very fast. So let me go back and go over the IF again. This is IgG, C3, kappa, and lambda. So I know there is some delay. So while I'm waiting for answers, I will just summarize the finding on IF. So what I'm seeing on IF is IgG. The material which we saw, which was Congo red positive, is staining for IgG. It is negative. That material is negative for lambda. That material is negative for kappa. We are so accustomed of looking at light chain amyloidosis, <clears throat> but this case is staining for heavy chain. This is IgG. T3 is positive on this one. So now we need to make a diagnosis, right? So when we see IgG positive, we have to make sure it is monotypic. So we ended up doing IgG subclasses, and it is positive for IgG subclass 3. So you are dealing with a heavy chain amyloid. So now we just need to prove the fibrillar structure on EM. So this is EM. It is showing you neutrophils and proliferation, which we ended up seeing on light microscopy. There are some hinge region deposits, so there might be a component of infection along with it and we do see amyloid. So we ended up confirming amyloid. So what we are dealing here is a necrotizing and crescentic GN with proliferative features. We are also dealing with amyloidosis here. This is a complex case. This is not an easy case. So amyloid is known 
like sometimes amyloid can have a crescentic pattern. But amyloid, we have seen ton of amyloids, right? Crescentic pattern is not very common with amyloid. So in this case, since the serology is pending, I need to rule out any autoimmune, anca, lupus, as you all said, any infection ongoing along with it before I blame the crescents on. If I have excluded everything, you know, I have ruled out all the autoimmune diseases, I have ruled out all the infection, I can think that crescentic process is related to the amyloid. In this case, at the time when I called, SPEP was negative. Maybe and amyloidosis is not very common. So we ended up confirming the results by mass spec. It was a heavy chain amyloid. Patient was diagnosed subsequently in that hospital stay. The patient was diagnosed with a lymphoma. So that fits. So we are dealing with a heavy chain amyloidosis here. Heavy chain amyloidosis is very uncommon. It is not common. Few specific points related to heavy chain amyloid. It is less frequent. Cardiac involvement is seen with heavy chain. You are having high likelihood to see a complete monoclonal immunoglobulin. Fat pad biopsy is not going to help you to make a diagnosis of amyloid. And there is higher incidence of hematuria and better patient survival. And hematological response is comparable to AL amyloid. So again, heavy chain amyloid, you can see it is not very common in the kidney. And this constellation of findings, which we have seen in this case, is very, very unusual. You don't see that commonly. Any questions popped up so far, Githika, or can we move on to our next case? Yeah, I think we can move to the next case. Okay, perfect. So let me show you another case. This patient is an 80 year old female Presence for evaluation of acute on chronic kidney disease. Urine analysis shows proteinuria. She has a past medical history of breast cancer, status post surgery, as well as status post uh, chemotherapy. Okay, so you got a biopsy from this patient, and now we are looking at this biopsy. And again, I will let you make your observations, and I'll help you out in those observations. So this is an HNE stain and you are observing the cortex, okay? And we are observing the cortex. Okay. So that is a very representative section of the cortex, but I know HNA is difficult from the pathology, kidney pathology perspective. So I'll show you PAS to make your observations and then we will summarize. And you can write your observations and your thought process. If you have clinched the diagnosis, you can write that in the chat box, because again, this is one of the classical cases. After the last case, I wanted to show you something light and easy because last case was very tough. I know you all are mentally exhausted and sipping some more coffee. So I wanted to show you a very easy case. So I know you have already clenched the diagnosis. So you can write the diagnosis in the chat box. And I will stop at a representative field. And this is a very representative field of the entire thing. So do we have the diagnosis yet, moderators? Um, I think we should wait for a few minutes, few seconds. Okay. The diagnosis popping up are LCDD, collagen of fibro, okay. glomerular nephritis. Okay. Waiting for a few more. Okay. So while we have those two diagnoses, so you are having some material which is PAS pale and is expanding the mesanger. Okay. LCDD can happen, right? LCDD can definitely happen, but it is very PAS pale. Okay, so you need something more. So you have to ask, like before making that diagnosis, can I get a Congore to make that diagnosis? Okay, collagen of fibrotic also is going to have uh, a different morphology uh, than this one. Collagen of fibrotic is not very common in US, but it is in India, it is very common. I have seen ton of collagen of fibrotics from India. It's more like a nodular GS, collagen of fibrotic. You will see nodules which are expanding. In this, the nodules are not very well defined. And this stuff, clearly looks something from outside has invaded the 
good name. It's very PASPL. So if I have to ask one more thing, I have to do Congo Red before I can make a diagnosis on this one, okay? And I am strongly suspecting amyloid on this one, okay? Again, keep on making your observations, okay? Because that is the most important thing, observations in pathology. So this is the Congo Red stain. And you can see the deposits are positive for Congo Red. See, I took you on a roller coaster ride with the last case, and I wanted to show you something which is very easy and simple. So this is congruent positive, beautiful apple green birefringence, and lambda positivity on IF, beautiful fibrils on EM. So this is amyloidosis. Are you all with me? Do you think, are we missing anything like we did in the last case? Or do you think, no, we ha I have shown you everything. I'm not I hidden anything from you. So do you think I ended up making all the right observations? Or no? Did I miss anything? I'm showing you again the same tree from which we moved to the diagnosis of amyloidosis. Is there anything I am missing in this field? Is there anything I'm not paying attention to? All the experts out there, what I'm not paying attention? Can you bring my attention to that particular thing? What am I missing? I'm like, man, I got it. Move on to the next case. What am I missing? It is right there in front of us, but we are not seeing it. It is like that heavy chain amyloid, which was right there in front of us, but we got digressed with infection and proliferation. Is there anything in this field which is worth noting and we are not noting it? Some people are commenting, look at the cast and see where it top. Okay. Uh, cast and? There is background if top. Background if top. Okay. Got yeah. it. So there is background if top, there is some cast. Okay. Background if top, I would have shown you trichrome for that to bring out attention. To bring out attention on the cast, I would have shown you PA stain. I'm not showing you that. I'm not showing you a trichrome stain. I'm not showing, showing you a PA stain. And I'm stuck with silver stain. And I want you to find that finding, right? So silver stain. Uh, sorry, uh, I ended up. So what you are seeing is black material in the background, this dark material in the background. Can you see this dark material? So most likely all of us ended up interpreting that as a junk on the slide. We thought, okay, there is junk on the slide, a lot of junk. So our mind did register that finding because we are habituated of ignoring junk on the slide, right? So this was the Congo red. Even when I focused on the Congo red, when I showed you the Congo red slide, we ended up ignoring that area as junk on the slide, okay? So, <clears throat> Is that really a junk on the slide? I will let you decide that, okay? This is where we were. This is the grass of that kidney. We ended up taking an image of the grass specimen of that kidney. This is again the grass specimen. Anyone with a diagnosis yet? This is again a very uncommon disease, not usually seen with kidney, but here it is. And we were fortunate that we were able to take photographs of the grass image on this one. I will let this image sink in for a second, and then I will tell you the diagnosis. Anyone with a diagnosis yet? Someone is asking whether the patient is having history of uh, knee transplant or any uh, joint re replacement. No, no. The comments are here. Yeah, that is a good thought process. We are thinking on the right direction. So I can I am showing you the deposits within the gland, and the granules are also present within the EM. So diagnosis on this case is Argyria. Those are the silver deposits. We ended up <clears throat> digging more on this patient, and the patient was taking silver supplement, and she was taking those silver supplements for last many years. So the patient is having Argyria. And there are case reports uh, which shows silver deposits within the kidney. 
So patient was subsequently found to have like blue skin and everything. So she was taking silver supplements for a while. So this is Argyria. <clears throat> this is again a very rare disease. And we were just fortunate that we were able to take because grossing this biopsy itself was very different. This biopsy grossly looked different. That's why we ended up taking a photograph of this one. This is not very common. Okay. So we ended up dealing with a lot of rare cases today. Okay, we have last few minutes, like last 15 minutes. <clears throat> so we will, <clears throat> are there any questions, moderators? Not yet. Okay, no, no question. So, oh man, so many rare cases. So let's deal with something easy and straightforward now, okay? So to me, diabetes should be considered as very straightforward because when I used to tell my friends, hey, I'm doing kidney pathology. What, kidney pathology throughout the day? What, man, this is just memories, diabetes, nothing else, no fun. Come to oncology, oncology is a lot, lot of fun. In medical kidney diseases, you see just diabetes, Ig, and memories. Memories has evolved drastically in the last few years, okay? We don't say a lot about diabetes. So I'm going to show you what fun you can have just with diabetes, okay? So this is another example of a biopsy which was performed on a 62-year-old male with history of diabetes and hemophilia. Patient presents for evaluation of acute kidney injury, and he has a history of chronic CKD. The baseline creatinine of two has increased up to 2.7. Serology is positive for ANA, as well as DSDNA is positive. Complement levels are normal, anchor is negative, okay? So one of the classical diabetic histories, right? So most likely you are dealing with just chronic kidney disease. You're seeing the nodules, the glam is almost dying. Again, there is a glam, a little bit of mesangial hypercellularity, but looks like diabetes. And the background kidney shows you a lot of scarring. Like this is all tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis. I wanted to bring up again, the importance of staining PAS. On h &E, it is very difficult to appreciate the TBM thickening. So you cannot appreciate the exact extent of tubular interstitial scarring on a silver, uh, on a h &E stain. That's why PAS stain is important. And you can see the tubular interstitial scarring on this PAS stain. So a lot of chronicity on this biopsy. And I'm going to show you the silver stain you can appreciate the little bit of hypercellularity on a diabetes. So basically, this might be just diabetes, you know, a very chronic diabetes in which you are seeing a little bit of hypercellularity to attach. But the important thing is that it is very chronic. It is very, very chronic, okay? To attach any meaning to this thing, you have to interpret the immunofluorescence, okay? Only then you will know whether this finding is important or not, okay? So I'm going to show you immunofluorescence. And I want you to interpret that immunofluorescence for me, okay? And let me know if there is anything important or not. So this is IgG. I will let you observe that immunofluorescence for a while. This is IgG. This is C3. This is Kappa. This is Lambda. This is Lambda and this is Kappa. If you want to see anything else, I can show you more. But this is basically the IF. So do you think IF is negative and we can call this as diabetes? Or do you think IF is positive? And if it is positive, what should I call? What is your diagnosis? Because background staining is common in diabetes and you are seeing that. So give me either or. Is the IF positive or negative? Very simple. So we'll just give uh, give it a few seconds on the chat box. Can we go back to the IgG, Shri? Hmm. Um. So, uh, Dr. Vas Kanan says pseudo linear IgG due to plasma leak. 
Dr. Gyan Priya feels that there it is positive with mesangial deposits. Dr. Miraj positive, and uh, Dr. Jansi has a uh, diagnosis. Should I put it yeah, out there? Yeah, you can tell me the time. Fibrillary. Okay. Dr. Gyan Priya fe feels that it, they are smudgy mesangial deposits. Mm -hmm. So it seems like um, that they are. It's real. Dr. Swan Lato. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I would like to add just that it's very difficult to take an image in a diabetic kidney because, as someone said, that there is normally a background staining. Like in the Kappa and Lambda, I wanted to show you that staining because you are going to have a high background in a diabetic. You are going to see that. And in a diabetic, normally also the nodules, they end up appearing very bright. But in this case, this staining is absolutely, you're absolutely right. This is the smudgy staining for IgG. And for a kidney pathologist, this is uh, like, they will say, oh, this is classical smudgy. That's why that diagnosis was clenched. This is fibrillary. Mm -hmm. So you do EM. And I wanted to show, the, uh, show you the EM because many times it is not important to go on high power and just measure the fibrils because I see many people emphasize a lot on measuring the fibrils because the pattern itself, gradually as you see cases of amyloidosis, fibrillosis, uh, sorry, um, fibrillary, the pattern of the EM in the low part itself gets very classical for fibrillary. You don't have to do the exact measurements multiple times. So in this case, there is nodular diabetic glomerulosclerosis along with fibrillary glomerulopathy. But if I am practicing in a place where there is no, uh, what I would say, EM, can I make a diagnosis of fibrillary confidently or not? If I'm sitting alone in a place where I don't have access to EM, can I make a diagnosis of fibrillary confidently just on that IF, or do I have any support or anything which can help me out to make that diagnosis? That is a question, and the answer for that question is right here. So even if you're sitting alone somewhere, you don't have access to EM, you can make a diagnosis of fibrillary. This is a DNA, JV9 stain, and it is positive in fibrillary. So do you think I ended up covering everything on this case? Like, do you want to do anything else? Oh my God, don't tell me. <laughs> so, so we have DNA, JV9 coming. You made the observations along with me. So anything else you would like to do in this case for sake of completion? Congolet, right? Always a good idea to do a congolet. So let's do a congolet on this one and see. We did a congolet. Can you see something? Interstitium is positive for congolet. The glams are negative for congolet. Can you see the interstitium which is positive for congolet? Yeah. So the interstitium is positive for congolet. In this one, what are you thinking? That's a very small amount uh, of congophilic deposits there, Shri. Yeah, so ignore it. No, no, but. Do a lecto. Because there are two options for you. What I have seen practically, which helps out, like when you see a very small amount of pongophilia or amyloid in paraffin IF, what we end up doing, do congruent on the frozen tissue, IF tissue. Because most likely that part might have been present on the frozen IF, but that is so small you cannot see it. But if you do a congruent on your frozen tissue, you can exactly locate where the amyloid was. And then take your kappa and lambda and analyze the same areas where the congruent was positive, and then see if it is positive for kappa or lambda if, or if it is negative, okay? That is one way of analyzing it. But in this one, the pattern was so like interstitial. Upfront, we ended up doing AA as well as leg two, and leg two was positive on this one. So you are dealing with a leg two amyloid. We also did a paraffin IF for kappa and lambda, and those areas are negative for kappa and lambda. So this is a leg two amyloid. So the complete diagnosis in this case will be diabetes along with uh, leg to amyloidosis again.
So this is nodular diabetes along with fibrillary and amyloid. So basically don't lose sight. In a kidney pathology, you might end up dealing with multiple findings and you need to help out your clinician. So that's why your comments are important, right? So in the comment, you have to emphasize what is important, what is not. Like in this one, if someone reads this report, if they read only amyloid, the patient might be subjected to different things, right? So you have to explain what is the importance of leg to amyloidosis. Hey, this is not related to lymphoma. So explain that in the comment section. And in kidney, generally, you will end up seeing multiple, multiple findings, okay? So whenever you see one finding, don't get anchored to it. Keep on looking. And we have seen multiple findings with diabetes, diabetes with fibrillary, diabetes with different kinds of amyloid, like just different combinations. So that was all I had for today. We are five minutes. Still, we have like five minutes. So if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. So I'll request all the participants. Um, uh, this is the time if you have any uh, questions related or unrelated, you can put them in the chat box. And uh, I, I had a few questions that I can go over. Uh, one I had was, so you, you know, with that small amount of amyloid, so do you do a Congo red in every case? Like, would you do it on every case? No, a threshold for ordering Congo red is very less when the patient is more than 50. Yeah. And specifically, like for Congo red, my threshold is even less than 50 sometimes when I'm dealing with a patient who is a Hispanic ethnicity. Because as I said, uh, the patient are not going to present with the classical pre uh, presentation of proteinuria, and they might end up presenting like a tubular interstitial disease. Then look at your PAS very closely because this PAS helps you out a lot. Those areas which were picked up, they are very pale on PAS. So look at your PAS very closely. Yeah, definitely. And keep the threshold for ordering congruent very low. Okay. Um... There are a few questions from the chat box which came up uh -huh. and uh, I'll take a few and if I missed any then others can also jump in. So there was sure. a question on um, how do you define the size for glomerulomegaly and is it related to the 40x field? Yes, more than 50% of 40x. If your glom occupies more than 50% of your field on 40x, you call that as a glomerulomegaly. There are mm -hmm. like measurements also and all that, but in day-to-day -day sign up, we use that as a criteria. Okay. Um, there was one question regarding policy for sectioning, especially when you're hunting for an FSGS. What policy for sectioning? How many steps is there, um, do you do? There is no policy like policy, you know, like it depends what disease you are dealing with. So suppose if the patient is having proteinuria and routinely we say do like 18 or 9, 20 sections. But if I am very suspicious, I can just go deeper on that. Okay, like 10 deeper, 15 deeper till I find it. If I cannot find it, then I will let you know that hope oh, there is no evidence of FSGS. And FSGS also depends on the number of glomps you have. So suppose I see like say 15, 20 sections. And if I have like 20 glomps sampled in there, I'm not going to hunt a lot. But if I have a very small biopsy of four or five glomps, I will look for that segmental sclerosis a lot. So I'm going to do many more deepers in that. So you cannot come up with the rule. It's case by case basis. You will make that. And also uh, what I have seen uh, look for FSGS lesions or focal lesions, even on the IF tissue. So what we do, we end up staining our IF tissue with hematoxin and eosin stain, HNE stain. So that also we observe. So if you have missed a finding on the light microscopy, like segmental sclerosis, you will be able to pick that up on your frozen tissue. Because on the stains, it is difficult to appreciate the morphology, but in HNE, you can do that. And would you use like the IgM and C3 when you see that, you know, kind of, uh, peripherally entrapped and it looks like a segmental sclerosis that also sometimes does help in terms of the yeah, pattern. IgM, yeah, in the sclerotic areas, you will see non-specific trapping for IgM as well as C3, that also helps. So in dark field, you can suspect, definitely. And uh, Dr. Ritamra had asked, do you think our population needs to have different criteria for diagnosis of obesity-related GN? I would love to have that study. That's why I brought it up because that will be interesting to do that study in India to define that because 
as we know, BMI is different for our Indian population. So now for the clinical things, we have shown it, but we have not uh, shown that thing for the kidney diseases. So I would love to see that study from India. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that's from the chat box from my side. Adarsh? There is one question. And they're asking that, uh, how in the previous case, how would you know that? How do you know that uh, the nodules are not due to fibrillary, and uh, how much we are certain that uh, it is related to diabetes uh, nephropathy? Because already we have proven that it's uh, fibrillary. Yeah. So yeah, it will be difficult, right? So there is a component of fibrillary, and there is a component of diabetes also. So diabetes is very predominant because you can see the nodules; they are huge. The amount of deposit is less in that as compared to the size of the nodule. So you are making a subjective judgment. But it will be impossible for you to make a judgment. Okay, out of 100%, that morphology was 90% of that morphology was contributed by diabetes and 10% by fibrillary. You cannot make that judgment. And clinically, that is not important. So I think both played on the morphology. It looks like diabetes was the predominant player just because the amount of deposits was less. But can you be 100% certain about it? No. There is another question. Uh... Could you use the uh, laser dissection of the organized deposit and subject them to mass spectrometry for evaluation of deposit? Yeah, you can do that. That is how uh, LCMS is performed. So for amyloid, it is more commonly done. So what they do, they take the slide, perform a congruent stain and dissect out the areas of interest. And you do that for any disease of interest. So there are a bunch of studies which have been published like membranous is the other thing. So we dissect out the glomps selectively, and then we do LCMS on that. So these were quite difficult and there were multiple pathologies involved. Look, after seeing these cases, I'm thinking that are we missing something because there are subtle, subtle features which you are uh, taking into consideration, particularly using different stains for interpretation of small, small findings. So that is the most important thing which in terms of nephropathology, we have to uh, keep in mind. Yes, special stains are very important. Like besides HNA, PAS, silver, trichrome, each stain has its own importance. The other common myth which I have seen, like trichrome, everyone says like it's very good for fibrosis, but simple disease like acute tubular injury will have a lot of interstitial edema. So you will end up seeing a lot of trichrome staining, but that doesn't mean the patient is having severe fibrosis. So that is where your silver stain, your PS stain is going to help. So when you make a, a simple diagnosis also, you take into account multiple stains. So that's why I said uh, for general surgical pathologists, when they make an interpretation on the medical kidney, you have to add at least PAS because silver and trichrome are technically very difficult. If your lab is not doing that routinely, it will be very difficult for you to do that stain. But PAS stain is very common and most of the labs do it, but that one stain is going to add a lot of value in the reporting. So definitely do a PAS stain at least, besides h &E, to interpret medical kidney biopsies. Um, Shri, that was amazing. Uh, I. I mean, it was mind boggling, just the number of things all packed into that one small kidney biopsy. And I'm sure that uh, all of us are going to be really looking harder uh, next time we sit uh, with kidney. So thank you for that. Uh, amazing cases, just amazing. Thanks a lot, Gitaka. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shri. Uh, it's always such a pleasure when one of your students way back from 20 years ago has uh, done so well and comes on and delivers such an amazing talk. What I really liked about your talk was that you had a little bit for everyone. You had a bit for the residents, for general surgical pathologists, for nephropathologists, and you took it from what looked like normal to what looked really out of the way. I mean, as a person who hasn't touched kidney for 20 years, even I was fascinated. Thank you so much for that. And I think Thanks, you turned your guide, Dr. Amit Dinda, proud because uh, our Dr. Amit Dinda has, of course, trained so many nephropathologists, including our own nephropathology team and people in Delhi, in the private sector, in addition to all the fantastic research which he does, of course. So uh, it's really happy to 
have you come on screen and uh, it takes me back 20 years when you and uh, you know the other people like Sridhar, Rifat and uh, Angela, Sanjay, all of you used to be there when I was a young assistant professor. I think I must tell everybody that she used to take wonderful uh, PG seminars. You know, he used to be as enthusiastic then as he is now. So he's a born teacher. So thank you very much. And I would also like to thank all the other people who contributed to making this uh, webinar series a success. Uh, Dr. Chitra Sarkar, of course, started this off. And uh, subsequently, Dr. Manoj is carrying it on. We will be coming to you every Saturday, the last Saturday of the month. And uh, except for December, of course, because we have a Christmas uh, vacation at that time. Uh, our senior faculty, Dr. Uh, Ruma Ray and Dr. MC Sharma, have always supported this webinar uh, uh, for uh, organizing it. In addition, of course, we have all the other faculty members, our nephropathology team, whom we have all met, and the young team of Dr. Anchal, Dr. Kavneet, Dr. Aruna, Dr. Ruchi, and Dr. Madhu, who are the assistant professors who help to organize this webinar each week. They work tirelessly, and I'm really happy to have, I think you got a little sense of the enthusiasm with which they work. So thank you all once again. We will be back with you on November last Saturday with the next webinar. And with that, I'd like to bring this webinar to a close. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <clears throat>